Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 3, Episode 24, the final episode of Season 3. We made it, guys. Believe it or not, we're here. <laughs> it, it, it's another season down. We got two more to go. There's only, I'm going to come back to that. There's only two, two more seasons to go, and there's shorter seasons, too. This episode is titled Heroes of the Revolution, and it originally premiered on May 8th, 1987. The writer, surprise, is Dick Wolf. Not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it is directed by Gabriel Beaumont, who we remember from Red Tape. So, uh, season three. As we can mention now, they reuse the same writer pretty often. We, we, we got to know this guy fairly well throughout <laughs> the <this> season. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like they finished production and they didn't have enough episodes. And so Dick Wolf himself had to write a bunch of episodes <laughs> that they had to. He just pump them out. Come on, Dick. You can do it. Just slim it in the middle in places where they were missing episodes. <laughs> Before we get started, I could check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, we're going to do kind of a show recap. Like I mentioned, we're at the end of season three. And we're going to obviously finish out the rest of the show. We're going to try and find those famed lost episodes. And, you know, there's some other Miami Vice stuff out there that we might be willing to talk about. But that does not mean that it's going to be the end of Go With The Heat. No, no. We have lots of plans, lots of things we would love to do, including... Short run shows. Melissa and I have talked about doing a short run Jean Claude Van Johnson podcast because you know this this is all about the eighties. Talk about Arnie movies, new Sylvester Stallone movies. <laughs> we like to cover the eighties, and so we want to continue to do that. We want to talk more about the movies and music and stuff from the eighties, and we also want to move on to another show at the end of Miami Vice. We have not decided what that show is yet. There's a couple ideas. A team, twenty one Jump Street, Alien Nation. Alien Nation, that's the strong <laughs> one right now. <laughs> For you two. It'll be short anyway. It would be a short thing. There's only two seasons of that show. <laughs> we have a ton of plans on stuff that we want to do. And like I was saying, short run stuff, long run stuff for for keep doing cop shows like 80s cop shows. So Crime Story was another one that, that we talked about. Yeah, that's a good one. Michael Mann. Mm -hmm. So... We have lots of things that we would like to continue to do, uh, but it's going to take a lot more of a time investment for us to be able to do that. Now, we're going to continue to do Vice through the entire thing, and we're going to pick up another show at the end of Miami Vice, and we're going to keep Go With The Heat going, so we have no plans of stopping. We're going to give the Go With The Heat treatment to another show after the end of this run, so we're not going anywhere. You're not going to be able to get rid of us. <laughs> <laughs> Try we're to that, shake us. We're that 80s show that just goes on three seasons too long. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of <80 shows> <laughs> but we would love your feedback so email us go with the heat at gmail.com let us know some ideas on shows that we might be able to move on to the key components here are crime or cop and it's gotta be music heavy it's gotta have like modern music which is why 21 jump street was one that got floated out there because of how important the music is to that show. We would love to also, hear from you donate money. We might be able to get interviews. I would love <laughs> to interview. <Alf> <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I get that. Interview. Dream of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so we would love for you to go to the website, go with the heat.com, click on support and see the ways that you can support us. The main way that we want you to support us right now is through email is through ranking or rating the show on your podcatcher of choice help more people find the show we do have some ways that you can give us a tip like through venmo or through paypal we do have those things set up now but we're not really asking for money what we're asking for is that you go check out the support and you go see the ways that you can share the show around we'd love to hear from you on what kind of show you'd like us to move on to if there's some 80 shows I you'd love asking, to see us do that i am asking for money make your checks out <laughs> to cash <laughs> and mail them to P.O. Box. <laughs> so looking forward, we have this is the last episode of season three. Next week, we'll do our season three recap and season four look ahead because Crocker's hair looks amazing and <laughs> Tubbs has his beard. Oh, sexy Tubbs beard. <laughs> Tubbs with a beard is the best Tubbs. He looks good. <laughs> Does the beard so make him more Jamaican? <laughs> yes, it does. He's extra Jamaican. <laughs> So we're going to do that episode like we normally do at the end of a season. Then we're going to have another episode after that one. And we're going to do 
uh, a look back through season three and all of our favorite moments. And then we're going to talk more about our future plans and some of the other ways that you'll be able to support us. So we would really love for you to c- come back, listen to those next two episodes and reach out to us. Go with the heat at gmail.com and let us know. Now, for someone that's not asking for any support, it's Klaus. Klaus is a one-man army. <laughs> he don't need you. He don't need anybody. <laughs> and he's going to move from Germany to Havana to take care of the Vice team. Let's go <laughs> talk about this episode. <laughs> so we open up and we're in Havana, 1961. Chaos on the streets as Gina version 2 <laughs> is walking down the road. Well, I mean, like <laughs> or version, version one. 1. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Military are picking people up off the street. She's walking down the road. I'm super confused. What the <laughs> hell is going on here? What is Gina doing in Cuba? <laughs> Why is she wearing that wig? <laughs> she walks this in. first spin part is very kind of soap opera. Because she walks in and there's a man waiting with a baby and she says hi and... So she starts getting ready to put on a show. It's clearly in a club because right after she walks in, you see the front door and two military people come walking in. One of them is saying, there's plenty of beautiful women in Cuba. Why do you keep coming back to this one? They're like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh-oh. I'm starting to have a feeling on where this is going. <laughs> in the room, Gina version one is taking care of Gina Jr. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, Gina in a wig. <laughs> <laughs> a baby wig. <laughs> Little known fact, she actually played the mom and the baby in that scene. It's incredible. <laughs> Her and the man in the room are talking. A lot of stuff happens in this opening scene of like a lot of little small details. He says we should make a baby of our own. Gina V1 says that we should get married. He proposes. In the club, Pedrosa, as we find out later, his name is Pedrosa. He gets a table. He's very important. They call him Commandante, and everyone gets out of his way. He actually gets a table that other people are already sitting at. Yes. <laughs> and demands French and he champagne. <laughs> the Dom Perignon. So he's ordering the fancy champagne and everything. So uh, right now, he's pretty optimistic with how his night's going to go. <laughs> In or the is room. he going to be surprised? in the room klaus that's the man's name he's saying he's going to talk to the russian embassy he's going to help get her out but it's clear that he's german i mean obviously name of klaus but also his accent and his ethnicity i was i was unclear on the accent to be honest (laughs) (laughs) i I was like okay so he's supposed to be german but why does he kind of sound like he's Cuban? <laughs> I'm not really trying, I'm stumped on this one. And then he says, I'm going to get you out of here. And he's clearly, it's like it's a spy and they're going to try and escape from communist Cuba. You kind, you kind of get the gist of it here in this scene. And then the announcer in the club says, now time for the main act. And we're going to call it Elena. And that's Gina version one. Or Gina's mom. <laughs> she comes out. And starts performing, singing, for real singing. And John, I know you're going to cover this, that Sandra Santiago singing in this episode. Yes, that's going to be one of the main topics of music about how Sandra, a.k.a. Gina, is going to serenade us throughout this entire episode singing three songs. Yeah, and she sounds great. So Yeah, while she's-, yeah she's actually a really good singer. Uh, which is what's surprising, too, is that she's a really good singer. None of these songs were ever released outside of Vice, not on any album or anything. Mm, wow. She never actually pursued singing, even though she was very good at it. I mean, she did do some plays and musicals. While Elena is performing, Pedrosa is out in the crowd, and he looks really distraught and dis- and depressed. The man that he's with is like, why are you torturing yourself here? He starts having a flashback with seeing pictures of Klaus and Elena together. And then he finally just snaps, stands up, pulls out a gun, shoots and kills Elena. Klaus comes running out, sees that his girlfriend, soon to be wife, has been killed and he just starts screaming, you're a dead man as other soldiers hold him back. And we go to the opening credits. That was some opening. Now, I didn't think... uh, 
I was with you guys. I thought her singing was quite good, so I thought that was pretty inappropriate for him to stand up and shoot her. That was an inappropriate um, reaction to her singing. Yeah, I mean, if she's bad, just walk out. You know, you don't have to shoot her. It does put a damper on your dinner. Normally, Vice, in season three in particular, is known for having a ton of guest stars. Every episode has a ton of guest stars. Big name guest stars, too. We just had Benicio Del Toro last week. This episode... Quite different. Gina is a one-person wrecking crew on this entire episode. Everything revolves around her. Everyone had to get out of the way. Pretty much. I mean, Gina guest starring as her as her mom, one of the bigger guest stars. So you'd be it's surprising being that it this is the season three season finale. Herzog, one of the main guest star, star actors, he's played by Jerome. Prabe or something of that sort. Basically, he's a <laughs> Dutch actor. He first appeared in American media in the movie Jumpin' Jack Flash in 86, and then immediately appearing in Vice here in 87. But other than that, he pretty much just guest starred in a handful of different movies and stuff, but nothing nothing too mainstream. When we, we go, okay, well, one of the other main characters, Pedrosa, He's played by Sean Elliott. Sean Elliott was a Puerto Rican actor and musician. As an actor, not very strong, but he did release a disco album called (laughs) Mr. Love (laughs) under the name Santiago. (laughs) Pretty good. (laughs) Funny enough, he released the album under the name Santiago. He has a Santiago connection. In Sandra Santiago, he was in a movie with Gina in 1984 called Beat Street. That one I don't know. I oh. think I might have seen that. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine being that being in 84 and being one of the one of her um, Gina's only credits before Vice, I would think that that's probably what got her the job on Vice. And then the only other real guest star to note is George Dickerson, who plays FBI agent Chet Blakemore. And once again, not really because he's a fantastic actor that everyone should know, but because he was an, a famous poet. In the 50s, 60s, he published poetry and was featured in such prestigious magazines as The New Yorker, The Saturday Evening Post, and Penthouse. Well. <laughs> Very prestigious. It's hard to get in there and then multiple times. You know, there's multiple ways to be credited as being published in Penthouse. I'm just saying. (laughs) In the 70s, he was a speechwriter for a couple U.S. congressmen. Before he was, he actually joined the U.N. relief effort, actually was stationed in Lebanon during the Lebanese Civil War from 75 to 76. Damn. From that, suffered PTSD, actually didn't release any new work as far as poetry is concerned until the 90s. So wow. popped up in a few and full of TV shows and movies over the years, but nothing big. I mean, unless you think uh, Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo is a good movie. Um, <laughs> well, there's got to be someone out there that does. <laughs> but yeah, that that's pretty much the height of your guest stars. <laughs> what a change. Now, I think it's a good thing because... Uh, It's been a while since we've had a Gina-specific episode, and it's great to see her in two roles. And I don't know how many episodes we have where this has got to be the only one where someone plays two different characters. Well, I mean... Well, I mean, we're not going to count Sonny's amnesia. (laughs) Well, I mean, he's two different people. (laughs) I feel like watching this series that I see people where it's like, I've seen them before. (laughs) So, <laughs> True. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. but And by the way, in case Sean Elliott isn't anything worth mentioning, we'll talk about it later when he's a DA or I forget whatever, <laughs> wh- whatever other character he plays. <laughs> <laughs> he comes back. <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, the ladies are following a car. Switek and Crockett are posted up outside of Main Street. They're on their normal stakeout routine, which means vice level surveillance. Now, credit to Vice yes. Surveillance in this one. They actually catch something, some little detail, unlike, <laughs> unlike normal. The ladies drive off as the car turns into the mansion, and they go to check on someone named Pedrosa, which they don't know who he is yet, or they've been investigating him. But details of what we know haven't come out yet. Garby and Pedrosa, those are the two pe- people's names that are at the mansion. They're partying at the house, and Stan immediately recognizes them. He also sees another cameraman 
who they don't know who he is, posted up in the bushes outside of the mansion, too. And that's that little detail that I was saying, like, actually, yeah, they actually she caught ca- something. Stan caught it, too. <laughs> See? Yeah, he, put it, he, put, he, put, he put down his magic book, and he now can pay attention. They, they've been practicing their surveillance. Mock surveillance <laughs> <laughs> trials. <laughs> Precinct Trudy is later going over the Pedrosa file. He came to Miami in 80. He owns a company. He, he's like doing money laundering through Miami. He grew up in Cuba, though. They also find out from Izzy because they say, what did Moreno have to say? So it's got to be Izzy, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the only Moreno in town. <laughs> that Garby is moving 10 keys a week from Pedrosa. So it's like he's laundering money and he's dealing. And Garby is Cuban, too, but he's been around for a lot longer. So like they don't really know like why Pedrosa's mixed up in this, like why he's selling drugs and moving money stan gets a call and it's someone else out at the stakeout and says that garby's on his way to the airport so everyone rushes out to go because they're gonna go follow garby on his way to new york but then stan also tells castillo about the other cameraman and dad says okay enhance the pictures on that guy let's see if we can identify him we'll ask the other departments if anyone else is working this case so the duo uh, the group of people that run out of the office to go to the airport. And they, we have a quick scene where we see them where Garby is about to catch a plane in New York. They actually get on the plane and we see it take off back at the precinct. Switek is processing the pictures and he realizes, even though he took all the pictures, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that this man is like the watcher. He's in 75% of all the pictures they've taken of Pedrosa and Garby. They just never noticed him. He's always been there. He's an observer. That's what it is. <laughs> he just needs a hat and a bald head, and he'll be the observer. So, so essentially, we're here we are giving them credit for all of their hard work, do, working on being better at surveillance. And it turns out for the last week, they haven't noticed another (laughs) guy taking pictures. Well, I mean, like I said, it's Dan. He doesn't always see a lot, okay? Sometimes he's busy doing other things. It only took a week. It took a week. But the important thing is he realized it. He realized what was going on. (laughs) Also that he's developing the pictures too makes me laugh. It's like, yeah, sure. Stan's a man of many talents. He can take pictures, develop them. He can do magic. He can set up wires. He's a man of many talents. He can sing Elvis. I was saying sing Elvis. (laughs) Castillo takes the pictures over to the feds and they call in Chet. And this is great. Like in the detail of this episode, I think it's really great that they have to say Chet by name and Chet comes in. It's a very casual scene where Chet just kind of comes in like, hey, what's up, guys? I'm Chet. What's going on? Yeah, I'm Chet. (laughs) (laughs) and i think we pretty much get the same kind of uh, fed bull crap they don't really know anything and they're all still Um, (laughs) d-bags if vice will be enough to do their work for them they will be more than happy to take credit for it we leave from the fbi offices we head over to pedrosas and my favorite part about this is that the pictures that marty was showing the fbi pedrosa is looking at the exact same pictures yeah so how did he get those pictures what is know. going on <laughs> do they just have like a stand standing shoulder to shoulder with one of pedrosa's men that's taking pictures of them yeah apparently <laughs> was third photographer how could they is it going to take him another week to notice this guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stan didn't even know he was standing next to somebody. <laughs> what we see here is that Pedrosa is taking pictures of Vice. He knows that the police are following him. He also knows of this other man. Now he didn't know about he didn't know about him personally, but the his guard detail did. And then when he sees that it's Klaus, he flips out. Like this man is extremely dangerous. You need to kill him right now. No delaying. Go go kill this man. We flash up to New York. And the duo are in a cab, and they're following Garby. And they have the greatest cab driver ever in <laughs> Ivan. <laughs> yeah. He says he's the best at tailing people because he watches the Rockford Files. Hey, that's a good show, by the way. I used to watch that when I was a kid. Garby stops. The cab stops. Ivan looks at the man who gets out of the cab, looks at where he goes into, and freaks out. Why did you bring me here? Why did you get me involved with this? I never did anything to you guys. Why Why would you do this to me and my family? And the duo are like, what are you talking about? Where did all this come from? <laughs> we just had you drive a cab. <laughs> and Ivan says, Garby just entered the Cuban 
the Cuban embassy for the UN, which I'm actually kind of lost on what that means. So why did that? Why should he be yeah. scared of that though? <laughs> I'm also kind of wondering: Did Carter and Dubs tell Ivan that they're police, or are they like undercover? Like, are they pretending to just Boris look in the party wherever that guy's going? <laughs> I would imagine that they're Burnett and Cooper, and when they go to New York, they can just have all kinds of wild stories. Yeah, they just make up whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, not Tubbs because he's from New York. You know, everyone knows him there. My favorite moment of this scene is that Ivan accuses them <laughs> of being Russian. And Tubbs is like, do I look Russian? Yeah, he says, are you guys KGB? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, do I look Russian to you? <laughs> Kronka <laughs> thinks it's hilarious, too. <laughs> <laughs> Out at Pedrosa, Stan is still watching Pe- Pedrosa's mansion, and he sees Klaus come like running out of the bushes with a bag and then hops in his car and drives away. Stan radios it in and then they start to trail, the ladies do, the ladies start to trail Pedrosa's men who are trailing Klaus. Now, One because- big long trail of people. So more, <laughs> more, more surveillance. This can't go wrong at all. <laughs> And Klaus is just out doing his errands. He's like picking up his dry cleaning and stuff. Like he's not. That's a weird priority. <laughs> I'm here to kill this man, but hey, you know what? I gotta have my my shirt starched when I do it. You think you wouldn't go pick up your laundry when you're doing? <laughs> Going to be killed, but hey, you know. And then Pedrosa's men try and do like a colors level drive by. <laughs> on Klaus as he comes out of the dry cleaning. The ladies see this coming up and Trudy yells out Miami Vice. They shoot. She shoots. Klaus actually pushes someone out of the way who still gets hit by the way. Yeah. We're not going to talk about that. (laughs) The car tries to drive away. It gets hit crashes the men get out and run klaus gets up and runs away too so no one is caught an innocent bystander is shot and a rental car is destroyed that was stolen that morning. It's not looking good yes. for the ladies here. <laughs> Everybody gets away, and the person there was surveilling is completely aware of them, also gets away. So, yeah, yeah. just... <laughs> it, everything kind of went bad right then. Later, when the rest of the police are there, they're questioning Trudy about who fired first. Gina tells Dad, pretty sure the other man got hit, but we don't know where he went. And the camera pans out and you see Klaus is in the crowd. (laughs) Once again, their surveillance (laughs) needs work. Dad gets a call and he just walks away. We kind of leave the scene with like, the lady's got nothing. They just saw a man get shot. Might have saved some people, maybe. And everyone got away. That about sums it up. (laughs) So at this point, I'm starting to wonder about Gina's dad. Her lineage, right? Well, uh, we know from the open that Gina's mom had baby Gina there when he proposed to her, but they made it, he indicated that he, like, she had him with, in a previous relationship. He wanted to have a, a, a kid with, with him after the fact, you know? So it made me wonder, well, Gina's dad, maybe, maybe Pedrosa's Gina's dad, because <laughs> Pedrosa is a he, revolutionary. He seemed to be revolutionary, seemed to be pretty into her. In uh-huh. Cuba, <laughs> you know, uh, most of the time, these type of things get violent when there's like, you know, it, it, it when it involves relationships. So I'm just thinking, I'm starting to wonder, <laughs> is Pajosa Gina's dad? Is Herzog Gina's dad? Are none of them Gina's dad? So... <laughs> We have a really fast scene at the airport where Garby's back in Miami. He's really nervous about coming back, and he uh, gets approached by the duo, and they place him under arrest. So he knew kind of like he was bound to be being followed. The vice team very, like, carefully and nonchalantly put him under arrest, which gives him plenty of time (laughs) to take a cyanide pill and commit suicide. And Tubbs the entire time is like, oh, no. (laughs) He's dead. Doesn't even bend down. He's like totally yeah. confused. He's like, what is going on? What is your problem? He doesn't even bend down. Yeah, like people Crockett's don't like, oh want to be around Tubbs and Crockett so much that they're willing to take cyanide pills <laughs> rather than have to ride in the car with them. At the precinct later, they're telling Dad, "We got nothing on Garby. We got nothing on Pedrosa. Garby's dead." Now, all that we know is that we saw him leave the embassy with those bags. Dad gets a call. It's with the FBI. They want to meet at a store. We see Klaus. He's being followed by someone. He pays off the clerk and say, you never saw me. He goes out the back door and the clerk lives up to his word. He says the goon shows the picture to the clerk. 
And the clerk's like, nah, I've never seen him. But then mysteriously, the clerk comes out the back door. So, huh. Mr. Clerk. Yeah, why did you like lead him out the back door? <laughs> and when the man comes out the back door, Klaus kills him with the piano wire around the neck. Before he kills him, he asks him, what kind of music does Petrosa like? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? Let me ask you some questions before I murder you. Does he still like the jazz? <laughs> Later that evening, we head over to Gina's and Gina's coming home. She opens up the door and she can see through her 80s glass hole in the wall that there's a man in her apartment. She pulls out her gun, starts yelling at him to, for him to say who he is. And he shows her a picture of her mom and him together. And that's all the evidence no, she no, no. needs. That, that, that's not a picture of her and her mom, him and her mom together. That's a picture of him and her in a wig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's all she t- all it takes is that one picture. And she's like, OK, I believe you. I don't know anything about my mom or dad, but thank you for filling me in. I'm going to set up a murder with you. Well, yeah, because it couldn't have been that long ago. I mean, she she's just wearing a wig. So this could have been taken like two weeks ago, a month ago. They were hanging out. Oh, don't get me started on how the men didn't age in this at all. I, I spent the whole episode going like, but they didn't age. Like, so why? Why? <laughs> It was in 1961. What this is 1987. The hell? <laughs> they look like it's, it's, it was okay. yesterday. <laughs> so, and, and what my favorite part about this is not only does she buy everything this guy says, just hook, line, and sinker, but we find out a little information. We find out that he is not her dad. We find out that he was just trying to bone her mom, who was a single mother <laughs> at the time. We also find out that he wants revenge for for Pedrosa killing her mom. And ruining, uh, basically cock blocking him back in the 60s. <laughs> so, um, had he been more important in her mom's life, maybe he would have had something to do with her raising her as a kid instead of her just being shipped off to her aunt. But we now know he has no relation. Like they could totally bone, and it just it wouldn't <laughs> be weird at all. Well, it would be weird, <laughs> just not like <laughs> legally or <laughs> it'll be morally weird. <laughs> I still think Pedrosa's her dad. <laughs> <laughs> There's a real fast scene in the middle of that, too, where the feds are explaining to the dad that Klaus is East German intelligence. He's also a very accomplished assassin. And also his dad was killed by Nazis, whatever that means. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> yes, yes, and that was that was the part that caught my attention. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, his dad was killed by Nazis. Uh, he works for East German uh, intelligence. Like, <laughs> yes, yes. But at the precinct, Dad is telling the team about Klaus. Tubbs is like, why can't the FBI do this? Why are yeah. we doing this? <laughs> Tubbs, always the man of reason in these things. <laughs> I'm so bored. Why do we have to do this crap? <laughs> Let the feds do it. <laughs> and Gina's doing a terrible job of hiding her nervousness. Yeah, I know. She's not very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she needs to like learn how to whistle or something, you know, for <laughs> if she's going to try and be inconspicuous. <laughs> then we go back to Gina's, and this is where we hear Klaus's plan. His plan is for Gina to get a gig at a jazz club, sing and sing well enough that Pedroso would want to come see her. And then when he's there, he will recognize Klaus and and then be angry, which will give Klaus reason to kill him. This is a very, very long and drawn out plan for something that could or potentially not happen. <laughs> yeah, he can clearly get around the mansion easily. Why does he just go in there and I kill I don't him? know. Also, how did he know she could sing? Just because her mom could? I guess so. <laughs> Because 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 it, it is Gina. <laughs> well, I mean, my mom yes. can dance, but I can't dance. <laughs> Depends on how you define dancing. <laughs> I just love how he pops nowhere, and his brilliant plan is: Hey, you're gonna get a job as a lounge singer, and I'm gonna be your manager, and we're totally gonna sell it, and we're gonna be so good that we're gonna attack the guy that murdered your mom, who's probably your dad, by the way. <laughs> um, Potentially your dad. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's when we're going to get them. Later in the episode, like, it's the same plan, but they're arguing about it because she wants to arrest them rather than kill them. So they're going to um, flip it around. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So then he's, like, all set, like, well, I guess I'll be the the, okay. um, <laughs> the, the bait. bait. <laughs> yeah, but he was going to make yeah. her the bait. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, he's totally willing. Yeah. So Gina falls for this hook, line, and sinker, too, because the next scene is her at the blue note. 
auditioning to be able to perform on stage there. There's one person when we come in who's really sucking <laughs> on stage. <laughs> <laughs> and Gina's incredibly nervous. So I don't know how he convinced her so easily because when she goes to the club, to this jazz club, she does not want to do this. But then she gets up on stage and she knocks it out of the park. Yeah, she's really good. Immediately switches See, I think she from... was nervous because she forgot her wig. <laughs> <laughs> she immediately switches from I'm really nervous to super confident sounds great jazz singer but this is going to leave gina really conflicted and that's where we're going to tie this up at the precinct the, the whole team is talking they still can't find klaus tubbs really doesn't want to work this case he's like why can't someone else do this he's so lazy <laughs> like, nah, I don't do it. <laughs> gina is really conflicted and she goes and talks to dad in his office at, at the end. It's such a touching scene. <laughs> oh my God. Go on dad's face. Basically just screams like, I don't give a crap. Like, I don't care. I know, Get out like, of no my office. To him at all. <laughs> well, hold on. Yeah. Hold on. She comes clean and says she's talked to him. She's seen him. He asks why she hasn't arrested him. You're a police officer. This is what you're supposed to do. You're under orders. You can't use your own judgment here. And she says that he's here to kill Pedrosa because Pedrosa killed her mom. I have never seen dad so mad. He is like going to hop out of his shoes. He is so angry. He is doing everything he can not to like. Punch her in the face. <laughs> Smack her right in the face. <laughs> and then when she comes clean and says it's that Pedrosa is responsible for killing her mom, he's still, he's like confused angry. <laughs> he's like, did you just learn about this right now? And she's like, yes. And then she's crying and he's like, okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a lot of talking for him because he doesn't do any talking himself pretty much in the entire scene. She offers to take a week off and she agrees. And so she's going to take a week off and dad's going to stand there quietly, not say anything. Just wait for her to leave because apparently his lunch is getting colder. <laughs> <laughs> also, what's really interesting here is you would think that as a police officer that dad would be like, okay, well, now we got to tail Gina. Because we don't know what she's going to do. Mm -hmm. But no. And she's like, I need a week off. No. And this is wh where she's going to sneakily take a week off and do Klaus's plan where she's going to sing at the Blue Note, set up a chance for Klaus to murder Pedrosa. And he's like, yeah, okay, cool. Like, I'll see you in a week. I hope everything you're up to for the next week is legal. <laughs> yeah, not going to question it. Yeah, because <laughs> dad doesn't care. <laughs> that night at the Blue Note, Pedrosa is coming in for a nice night out. He's dressed really nice. He's in a suit. Looks great. Looks like, yeah, he looks nice. You know, maybe he's changed his ways. He's just selling drugs in Miami. Maybe he's not a murderer anymore. He's also with a woman who has the biggest hair I've ever seen. <laughs> it's so high in the air. <laughs> And Gina is going to perform that night. She comes out on stage. She starts singing fantastically. And it slowly yeah, yeah. starts to creep across Pedrosa's face. And he eventually oh. goes back to the flashback of him shooting Elena and seeing Klaus. And it finally clicks. And he's like, I don't have to put up with this bullshit. And it just storms out. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, huh? Gina is so good that he's having flashbacks of murdering her mom. Sitting there like, man, this is just, this reminds me of when I killed this bitch back in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't he actually kill her. It was just her in a wig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's when he gets all upset and just storms out. <laughs> And so Gina heads over to Klaus's after the show, and this is when they flip the roles. She says, I can't set up this you killing Pedrosa. I have to arrest him. Klaus caves and says, well, fine. Then we'll switch. I'll be the bait. You perform. He'll see me. He'll try and kill me. Then you arrest him. Guess I'll take that as a consolation prize here. At the precinct the next day, the feds are talking to Vice and they want Vice to arrest Pedrosa because he's a Cuban diplomat. So they don't want an international incident with the American government picking up Pedrosa. They want the local police to pick him up under a drug charge. The Vice seems like, all right, I guess we'll do your dirty work again. Yeah, no, Tubbs is not happy, though. He's like, why are we doing this? Why Why can't you guys do it on your own? <laughs> <laughs> Once again, common sense coming from Ricardo Tubbs. Ah, he's just bored. 
<laughs> so we, we jump back to the bad guy's house. And that what I love about this scene is that Pajosa is going to go take care of essentially Gina at the club himself. And so he takes off. And of course, the vice squad comes swooping in just after he leaves. And all of the henchmen are like just chilling, having lemonade. <laughs> like they just, they've got the whole house to themselves. Like just, just... <laughs> I don't know for what reason Pedro also decides to go by himself. He says this for honor, but you would think that someone of his stature and hadn't the put he knows the police are out to get him and all this stuff yeah. that he goes by himself. And then when the vice team come busting in on their warrant, because now they, they have approval from the feds to go bust him on the drug charge, when they come busting in, they're you're right, like they're all just kind of lounging around, yeah. carrying around big trays of cocaine. <laughs> and then my favorite part of the episode is Tubbs gets one of the bodyguards and he's like, Where's Petrosa, chump? And the man's like, Screw you, buddy. And then Tubbs judo kicks the <laughs> plate of cocaine out of his hand. <laughs> and it gets all over his face, like all white. And, <laughs> and in that one move, uh-huh. the guard changes his mind. He's like, he's at the blue note. <laughs> <laughs> Forget it. It's not worth it. <laughs> so then the vice team are going to rush off to go see if they can help Gina because Trudy says... When she hears the blue note, she's like, I heard Gina say that she wanted to audition at that club. And they're like, well, what is she going to do there? She goes, I don't know. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I don't know what happened, but that's what she yeah. said. I don't know. That bitch was talking blah, 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 blah. All I heard was the blue note. Something about the blue note and some guy pretending to be her dad. I love that part of the, the scene where because also after he kicks a plate, the guy still doesn't talk fast enough, so he just like picks his leg up and threatens him. <laughs> like, I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> you son of a don't make me do it again. And the guy's like, he's at the blue note, he's at the blue note. <laughs> and then everyone just <laughs> runs off and leaves Trudy alone. And yeah. Melissa, you were saying like what? It's Trudy's her it's her partner. Why would you leave her to do all the hard work while you guys run off? It's a house of like 12 goons yeah, and, and Trudy. Yeah. <laughs> Trudy. She's like, Trudy, 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 do this, Trudy, do that. What am I, like Cinderella in this place or what? <laughs> so at the Blue Note, here we are at the last scene of the episode. Gina is singing. She sounds great. She's performing great. She has a career in this. Yeah. You know, like, hey, if ice doesn't work out, you know, oh, you got yeah. a great career oh, so she's getting singer. into it we get a little bit of her like riffing between tracks and now coming up we're gonna do this <laughs> klaus is stationed around page also shows up and she's kind of signaling to klaus like hey he's in the back over on the left <laughs> and he does not get it like, <laughs> i didn't understand what was going on i thought he was moving around on purpose i'm like is he trying to like really draw him out so he's like moving across the stage like moving over here moving over there or no, he really didn't see him. I didn't understand what he was doing. Yeah, he doesn't. He really doesn't see him. And Gina's trying to be like she's like stomping her foot, like moving her <laughs> hand and over there. Like <laughs> Pedrosa finally sees Klaus. He comes running over. He pulls his gun. Klaus jumps out of the way. Gina yells. Miami Vice shoots and kills Pedrosa just as the duo come running in to see Pedrosa hit the ground and see the crowd scatter. They come running over to Pedrosa. They see that he's dead, and they just give Gina this super disapproving look. Yeah. <laughs> well, hold on, hold dead. on. <laughs> Gina pulls out the gun and kills Pedrosa, but I am pretty sure Pedrosa got a few shots off before that. <laughs> he just whips. So, I mean, yeah. They're, they're, oh, well, no. Their, their plan worked, and only a few people in the crowd got shot. <laughs> just a few. It just grazed them, really. I mean. Just a few. You know, and I, I think that's why the vice had that disappointing look. You know, it's like if we had been here, more people in the crowd could have gotten <laughs> shot. Yeah, no. no, I love that Tubbs is always way more disappointed than everyone. It's like I had better. I had high hopes for you. Crockett's this like, shit wouldn't happen in New York. <laughs> yeah. Crockett's like, I'm sorry. I feel sad for you. But not Tubbs. He's like, Shh, whatever. I would never let myself do that. <laughs> <laughs> On a side note, she did just kill a Cuban national who, with diplomatic immunity. Yeah, but that doesn't matter, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> just throwing that out there. <laughs> Klaus takes that as his cue to leave. He runs out the side exit. Gina comes running out He's after late for him. A flight. <laughs> Gina comes running out after him. 
He's 20 feet or so down the sidewalk. He hears her come out. He pauses and then continues to walk as if to signal to Gina what could have been. I got revenge for your mom, or you did, but I helped you Do it. set this up. I think that was a, a very disappointing back and forth without words between Gina and Herzog. Because Gina's got that puppy dog. I thought you were going to be my manager. We were going to do talent search. <laughs> we were going to go all the way. Oh, and Herzog's like, I got mine. Now I'm getting out of here. Because uh, it turns out I got this whole family back in East Germany. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm going to save my thoughts on that last moment for my final thoughts. Because I actually think that they do an okay job of summing that up there. Be, and like signaling to you in just a few seconds what Gina's life could have been. So, but I'm going to come back to that, my final thoughts. Let's go talk about this week's music. Because as if you haven't heard enough about Sandra Santiago and Gina, <laughs> you're in for it for in the music. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John, I've been hinting at it all episode. We talked a little bit about it in the beginning but this music seems heavy on one person. Gina episode, and Gina, Gina took the liberty of singing three of the four songs. Those songs are Begin the Beguin, Stormy Weather, and Someone to Watch Over Me. But before we talk about the songs, let's talk about Gina. As we've talked about Tubbs in the music, we've talked about Crockett in the music, and talked about Judy in the music. So now this is our turn to talk about Gina. Sandra Santiago, her backstory is actually the backstory I would imagine for Gina. Just follow me here. Sandra Santiago is the daughter of a Cuban father and a Puerto Rican mother. And she was raised in the South Bronx, New York, until she, at the age of 13, she moved to Homestead, Florida. Oh. The Gina-esque. Moved to Dade County, Florida when she was 13. Graduated high school from South Eda Senior High School and attended the University of Miami, where she would major in psychology. After school, she would get a job with the Miami-Dade Police Department and become a detective for the Miami Vice Unit. Oh, no, wait, that's her character. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, looking at each other like, what? <laughs> no, yeah, but no, I mean, just like up to that point, she's basically Gina. <laughs> But no, it turns out in while she was at the University of Miami, she got into acting. She ended up doing postgraduate work at SMU. She would get a master's in theater and arts. She would then join Timberlake Playhouse in Mount Carroll, Illinois, of all places, before basically getting started in Hollywood. Before she would get a role on Vice, she would play the lead role in the 1984 movie Beat Street with Sean Elliott, as we learned earlier in the episode. After Vice, she would play Carmen Santos, who was a crime boss for three years on the soap opera Guiding Light. She would also make numerous appearances on The Sopranos as The Sopranos' next-door neighbor, Jenny Cusmano, and... Jenny Kuzmano's twin sister, Joan. <laughs> she played twins, and, even? And she was just, yeah, she actually played both roles, but I, I think they only showed Joan or referenced Joan in like two episodes. So other than that, she's done a bunch of other guest star work. She's appeared in Law & Order, Person of Interest, Blue Bloods. Recently, she appeared in an episode of Gotham and also appeared in the series True Detective. So what you're telling me so, is... Is that before we started doing Go With The Heat, I have seen Sandra Santiago in some of my favorite shows and did not recognize it was her. Exactly. Yes, that is what I'm saying. She was uncredited as a patron dancing and happened to be the patron dancing with Al Pacino in Carlito's Way. Mm, so there wow. is a scene... In which Al Pacino is dancing with Gina, though, or Sandra Santiago, though uh, uncredited. Getting back to the musical side, I mentioned that she was in several Tony Award winning plays that she did musicals. Also sang on two of her six appearances on the Johnny Carson show. And you can still occasionally catch her singing at several cabaret clubs in New York. No I mean, shit. To this day. That might be a reason to go to New York uh, just to catch a Sandra Santiago performance. Now that we've talked about Gina, let's talk a little bit about the songs that she was actually singing. She sang a uh, song, Begin the, the Brain, or was originally written by Cole Porter in 1935 during a Pacific cruise somewhere between Fiji and Indonesia on the ocean liner 
Franconia was first performed in June Knight's Broadway musical Jubilee, though it wasn't popular until it was performed by Artie Shaw in 1938, uh, in which that version would peak at number three. Some other famous times you might have heard that song are Fred Astaire and Eleanor Powell dance to it in the movie Broadway Melody of 1940. There's Frank Sinatra did a version of it, Fitzgerald, and even Elvis did an adaptation. The next song she does, Stormy Weather, was written in 1933 by Harold Arlen and Ted Kohler and first performed by Ethel Waters at Harlem's Cotton Club. It's been famously covered by Sinatra, Judy Garland, Etta James, but most famously covered by Le- Lena Horn and Billy Holiday. By the way, l- original handwritten lyrics actually showed up on an episode of Antiques Roadshow in January 2011, <laughs> and they appraised for between $50,000 and $100,000. Yeah, I just know based on my experience of watching Antiques Roadshow, if you were looking to be like a pickpocket or break into people's cars, you might want to go attend one of those events. <laughs> People <laughs> carrying around all their valuable stuff. Uh, finally, she also did the song Someone to Watch Over Me, which is the 1926, written and composed by George and Gershwin. The musical OK, as in K-A-Y, the name K. By the way, Ella Fitzgerald recorded a version of this with the London Symphony Orchestra that actually recently peaked on Billboard's classic albums charts at number 6, October 2017. Susan Boyle also did a rendition in 2014 that peaked at number 4 and spent 14 weeks on the Billboard 200. So some pretty big songs, all of them old. 20s and 30s jazz tunes. So all of that brings us to the very last song in the episode, the only song not performed by Sandra Santiago, the jazz singer performed by Nancy Reed, or now she's known now, Nancy Reed Cantor. Here's the deal, guys. Very difficult at first finding information on this song. When I first approached this, it took me a while. Nancy Reed, she's a Juilliard trained pianist who's been performing since back in the day. Everything that I saw from the Vice as far as the IMBD stuff and, and some of the other sites I look at said that the song is from the jazz singer, a musical play, and a film from 1927. The jazz singer, film from 1927, the one of the very first talkies, one of the very first movies that actually had sound. Wow. And it was credited as pretty much the end of the silent era, or basically killing the silent film era. It was directed by Al Crossland, and was adapted from a Samson Ralphson play, and all of the songs were performed by Al Jolson. Al Jolson, by the way, was perfor- was famous in the 20s and 30s as a jazz singer and performer, who sometimes performed in blackface, as you guys mm. saw a... YouTube clip that I sent you earlier of him singing the song Mammy in blackface. Um, yeah, it was it was not good. No, it was really offensive. It was, it was really bad. <laughs> and, and it's, it's so, from an era that we try really hard to forget that was a thing. And then when you see it, you're like, my God. It's worse than you think, yeah. The play itself actually comes from a Samson Ralphson short story called The Day of Atonement. The The film was actually remade twice in 1952 by Danny Thomas and Peggy Lee, and then in 1980 with Neil Diamond and Lucy Arnaz. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Diamond. That's, that got me. <laughs> So everything that I, I could find was telling me that this was that song. The only problem is, is that when I looked up the album or the movie, The Jazz Singer, and I looked at all the songs, none of the actual songs in the film or in the play are actually titled The Jazz Singer. So I did some more research, and none of the songs were matching up lyrically with the song that Nancy Reed performed live in the episode. Uh, so I'm, I'm going through and I'm like, well... This doesn't make any sense. This The song can't be called The Jazz Singer. It has to be a song from The Jazz Singer. And then none of those matched up. So I'm looking through and I to do more research on Nancy Reed. And what I found out, in 1987, Atlantic Records did a big band album of Nancy Reed's original songs called oh. The Jazz Singer. Oh. 
Hall. Some acclaim she was featured a uh, featured performer at Carnegie Hall with Skitch Henderson and the New York Pops. And so my thought is is that she is actually singing the song The Jazz Singer from her 87 album of original songs. So I'm thinking, well, why would people get it confused? How would that tie in to Al Jolson? Nancy Green Cantor moved to Miami Beach in 1939 after her father died, and she would become a regular performer at Miami Beach hotels. She was mentored by Al Jolson, who was a... <laughs> Commonly was a winter visitor in Miami Beach. <laughs> so her mentor was Al Jolson, who sometimes does blackface. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> Go on to Juilliard, become a classically trained pianist. In the 50s, she would hook up with, funny enough, Sketch Henderson and Benny Goodman and their band. She would tour Europe in the 50s with them. And she would also be a regular performer in New York. And on ABC, Dumont, and NBC television, she was actually retired, came out of retirement in 87 to make that album for Atlantic Records. And she was retired because she met a lovely man named Joseph H. Cantor, who, a uh, World War II vet, had invested in eight veteran apartments and eventually became a developer, producer, and started the Joseph H. Cantor Family Foundation, which him and Nancy Reed basically spent the rest of their lives or or so up to this day still run the foundation. She's listed as the secretary. Her husband Joe mentioned he, he produced movies Ironweed and The Big Bang and after a rough first date with uh Nancy, his sec the second date, he gave her and her mother a ride in his new convertible caddy and his mom told her that she should she shouldn't let this one go. And they've been married and splitting their time between Malibu and Miami Beach for the past 60 plus years. This was a much deeper dive on Nancy Reed than I thought existed. Because <laughs> there's like no link or anything that I saw was available for her. I'm like, okay, this is going to be a nobody. <laughs> I went all over the place in my research because it was bugging the hell out of me. I couldn't figure out why the song wasn't matching up. And it took me all over the place and eventually to Nancy Reed's actual Facebook. <laughs> She's like pictures of her grandkids <laughs> on there. <laughs> and an article from the Malibu Times that was basically talking about how they've been married for like 61 years and how, how cute of a couple they are. <laughs> well, at so. least she knew her dad. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, the music went down a path no one expected. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode, because here we are at the end of season three. And we're not going to do a recap on season three. We're going to talk about just on this episode. But I have a feeling this to be some divisive opinions. So let's go talk about our final thoughts. All right, John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? My final thoughts is that this just felt like an episode that would normally run in the middle of the season. But for some reason, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just on the season finales and how big they've been in the past couple seasons. I felt like this season finale wasn't quite the blowout that I kind of expected it to be. Not saying that it was a bad episode in any way. I just, I was expecting, you know, all of the fireworks and the guest stars and the music for the last episode of the season. And instead, what we got was a very nice story that provided some backstory as far as what we know about Gina and where she comes from. I enjoyed having a Gina episode because I felt like it's been a while since we had one. I felt like this episode had everything there for it. I felt it was a little slow at times, including the, the second half of the episode when I felt like we were all just kind of waiting for that last nightclub scene. But I really enjoyed actually Sandra Santiago singing. She's actually a fantastic singer. And throughout everything that we do with the podcast, I will say, I feel like I really know Nancy and Joe Cantor now. I really know those guys. <laughs> I feel like 
I could almost show up on their doorstep and they would like make me a sandwich and show me old <laughs> pictures of Joe in his his World War II uniform. So it, it's kind of a mix for me. Like I, I like things about it and there are things that, that I felt were lacking. But all in all, I mean, I thought it was pretty good, but maybe not an end of the year spectacular. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Uh, I like the episode because I like that it's it's Gina centric that, you know, I like Gina. I want to hear more about her background and where she comes from. It was kind of sad that she doesn't have her parents. Maybe I go too deep in it. And I'm like, and at the end of it, she still has nobody. <laughs> nobody wants to be with her. No. The only thing that really bothered me about the whole episode in general is, um, like I said, it was a good episode. I, I like seeing her singing and that she was actually singing is amazing because she, she can sing very well. It's the fact that it seemed kind of added character for Gina to not get everyone else involved. I feel like if that was really going on, she would tell Crockett and Tubbs, at least tell Trudy like what was going on. But they, yeah. like, she just like shut everyone out and it was like, we don't really want them in this episode, so we're just not even going to bring them into it. But it doesn't seem like that's the way she would do it, especially... After last episode where she told Crockett where the bad guy was going to be like, secretly, she wasn't supposed to and stuff like that. It just seems like she would that she would want to confide in them that they would know and they would help her. But instead, they just like kind of isolated them off and they just it was just the Gina episode, which is good. But I do kind of agree with John that it was kind of a strange episode to end on. Well, here's where I'm going to break with you two on that. And, and I can't say anything more than what you guys said about Sandra Santiago singing. How great it was, and and what I'm going to say, and I'm going to gush a little bit about the episode, and what I say that yes, the previous two seasons, the end episode has been like this big explosive, big tent pole episode, especially last season where we have Tubbs losing his baby. Yeah. So, but what I love about this is that we got such a deep dive. We know more about Gina than we know about any of the other characters in Vice, including Crockett. This episode gave us such a huge backstory. I actually really enjoyed that this was exclusively about Gina. That's all that this, this was about. She even played two different people in this. Like, they literally cleared the deck. She played the baby Gina as well. <laughs> They literally cleared the deck and let them tell an entire story about one of the Vice characters. Now, this hurts. This hurts because we could. It's what could have been with Zito, and we lost Zito. But we got this such a huge backstory on Gina. It was actually really nice. And the last scene that it really stuck with me, Klaus is walking on the street. He pauses for a moment and then walks on, and Gina's walking, watching him leave. And you think about all the things that Gina has been through in her life. She lost both of her parents. She lived with her aunt, who wasn't the best person to live with. She was rushed off to Miami to live with her aunt. She doesn't know anything about any of her parents. This is the first thing that she's heard that it's the honest to goodness truth of who her parents are. And the man who could have raised her, even though it wasn't her real dad, the man who would have raised her if it wasn't for her mom being shot and killed, just walked out of her life forever because he is an East German spy and can never return. They can never have a life together. And so although it may not have the big explosions like the previous seasons, punched you right in the gut. Yeah, in the, that emotional, last scene. the emotional mm -hmm. gut, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and, and to your point, Melissa, maybe she didn't want to involve the other vice people because she didn't want people to know that Pe Pedrosa was her dad. <laughs> 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 On that bombshell. <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Like I was mentioned in the opening, email us, heat at gmail.com. Tweet at us at GoWithTheHeat, facebook.com slash GoWithTheHeat. Let us know what you think about this episode, about Gina and her singing ability, and about Sandra Santiago. And how come there's no, like, where can I buy a Sandra Santiago album? Let us know. Email us, goldtheheat at gmail.com. We'd also love to hear from you about what I talked about in the opening is where the direction of Go With The Heat's going. What kind of shows sh should we cover next? What kind of side projects would you want us to do? Check out that website, goldtheheat.com. Click on subscribe. You can find all the ways to find the show. Click on support. You can find all the ways to support us. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We'd love for you to come back next week and hear our season three recap. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.